Good evening, everyone. We're ready to begin. Although we heard that Midland Avenue was closed due to an accident, so some people could still be on their way. But uh, for those of you who've been here for a while, we don't want you to uh, be waiting. So we're ready to start. But before we start the formal program of this evening, I have the honor to introduce to you uh, Kat Krieger. He's an indigenous elder, traditional teacher and mentor from the First Nations people. He is of the Cayugan, or people of the Longhouse, Turtle Clan, and is of German and English descent as well. Kat has been working as a traditional teacher and healer for more than 25 years in the indigenous and intercultural community in Canada and other places in the world. He was taught in the old way, working for many years with the guidance of an Anish Nawabi elder and other indigenous elders, and was taught to do healing, plant medicine, traditional ceremonies, teachings, circles, one-to-one -one work, and to help all people to walk in a good way through life. Kat has worked as an elder and advisor in many government ministries and indigenous agencies in Ontario and Canada. He was also a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work. Presently, Kat holds the position of indigenous advisor at the Indigenous Centre at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus, he is a sessional instructor and guest lecturer in multiple faculties at the University of Toronto and other universities, colleges, and schools. In his spare time, Kat is an archer, astronomer, artist, hiker, kayaker, and he participates in extreme sports when possible. And he's pursuing a degree in photography, raising his car and enjoying spending time chatting with his kittens. Now let us uh, invite Elder Krieger to give us the indigenous welcome. And I was just wondering why I'm so tired, now I know. <laughs> so, Sego, Tanse, Wena Bojo, Makwa Gish, Gad Nishnikaz, Jikan Dodem, Keugan Dunjaba, Keugan Nishnabe, and Dao Miwa Gajak and Dishnikaz. Ambe Majada, Obi Bida, Bida Ben. My, sorry, my Ojibwe is really bad. Miigwech, skobani kwe, miwa manado gisus, manado nokmas, miwa gitchukumi mide wabo, miwi shagana shishubangi. So the, I'll go backwards. The last part says I'm going to speak English, um, and I really don't speak Ojibwe very well. I'm Cayugan, which is part of the Haudenosaunee people, the Six Nations, uh, as well as German English. So I, I'm my own. You know, every day I have to go through race relations. <laughs> Just to make sure I walk in a good way. The start of that was my spirit name, Makwagishgat, which means sun bear. The other little bit was about uh, my, my totem, my, my clan, which is turtle. And then, again, the Kyogen English, the German part that says, this is my DNA, this is who I am. And part of when I do a, a, an acknowledgement of the land, as it's called in English, is to introduce myself to the very place I'm standing in. So my, my German-English ancestry, that's from across the water. The Cayugan ancestry, that's from where those little dotted lines are drawn on the map in what is now upstate New York. So I'm not really originally from this area. This area that we're in right now is under the care and the, and the caregiving of the Mississaugas of the Credit. That's the tribe that's been here for the last little while, or as we say, thousand or so years. That's a little while for us. That I, I recognize that it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to stand on this land. And that I recognize also I have a responsibility while I'm here on this land to walk in a good way. More of those words talk about the sun coming up in the morning. If anybody's heard me talk before, I always start off with this about that concept of sunrise. The sun coming up in the morning and reminding each and every one of us that we have a responsibility as humans. Ambe Majada, come on, let's get up. Let's be the way we're supposed to be. Let's walk the way we're supposed to walk. And we can't forget because the sun reminds us, go through life, spread light, bring warmth, and bring life to everything around you as you walk your path. More of it talked about that uh, symbiotic relationship with the moon, how they share that light and it's reflected back to this planet. So even though the moon's spinning, the earth is spinning, the moon's going around the earth, and we're all going through the sky with the sun and around the sun, that it still has a face. That moon always has her face towards earth watching over us. It's like our grandmother keeping track of us. So when we think in that way, when we think about where we're standing, we develop an idea that we are standing not just by ourselves, but with everything around us, all of creation, 
and all the people that are here now walking this, this world that we live in, that we share. And there's, a, there's an imposed responsibility. And part of that says in English that I should respect each person here for how they walk, how they talk, how they pray, how they dress, how they carry on relationships, how, the, how they walk through life. Whatever it is, the song that they sing, that is so important. And that respect is due back. So it goes both ways. It's symbiotic. Again, we come up with that symbiotic relationship. Mm, yesterday we were, Cheryl is somewhere. There's Cheryl. <laughs> My partner and I were at a celebration of the 70th year of the, uh, um, this Declaration of Human Rights. 70 years ago. That's a long time. That means anybody sitting at that table originally, I'm not sure they're still here that there's a responsibility passed on when we think about things like that. In 2007, we had the, uh, the, the declaration by the UN, again, about human rights. It keeps coming back to that. Very recently, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation for the Indigenous People, 2015, and it carries those calls to action, those 94 calls to action. And it's really interesting that each one of these tables has basically what is a call to action. I'll broaden that out a little bit further, although recently this has been focused on the indigenous people in this country and teaching the true history of this country, which is rather discriminatory. And it didn't really acknowledge rights. And that's not an individual blame on people. As I said, I'm part German, part English. But the idea that when I looked at that TRC, when I first read the 94 calls to action, I realized I could take that almost anywhere in the world and template it over a country, over another place, over another culture. And all the same things are being asked for. Health, employment, access, religion, belief systems. Just simple, straightforward things that we need to walk through life to stop discrimination, to make education available to each and every one of us. There are so many things there and there's so much. You know, it's, it's like speaking from the heart. I can't do it in here because we have little fire extinguishers. There's little things that would go off and we'd empty the building. But typically we start a gathering in a circle with a smudge. Has anybody smudged before? Some of us have. We take a bit of sage in a bowl. I use a shell. It's lit. There's a beautiful smell that comes up from it, a bit of smoke. We metaphorically wash our hands and take some of our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, and we breathe a little bit in over our heart. And it brings us together of one mind. It's like a mindset. It's like remove negativity. Let's bring us all together looking into the center where that traditional fire would have been going. It reminds us of that sun coming up and that fire at the heart in each and every one of us and how important that is to nurture, to make sure that stays warm, to make sure it's spreading light, warmth, and bringing life to everything around us. So we take that smudge and do all that. And what it says is everything that comes from us tonight, everything I touch, I'm going to touch with my heart. I'm going to speak from my heart. I'm going to look at things from my heart. I'm going to think with my heart. And very importantly, I'm going to listen with my heart because tonight's gift is delivered by listening by seeing. And it's a gift. It is a gift to receive knowledge and wisdom. We were talking a little bit at the table over here about education and how there seems to be a decline in respect for our philosophers, for our teachers, for our, our professors, for Lao Shi, all those ones who carry wisdom. It doesn't seem like it used to be. When I first started working at the university, I thought I would go there and there'd be people in long black robes and we'd be sitting out in the lawn under the apple tree or something, discussing philosophy with great respect, listening to words of wisdom. Yet now I hear people constantly trashing people that are the teachers, the ones that are knowledge keepers, the ones that are the wisdom carriers, the ones that are, 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 are the ones that are bringing knowledge forward. And that's so important. You know, nowadays we go click, click, and, oh look, now I know what I'm doing. My vet one day said, that's like standing on Young Street at Queen and Young and yelling out, my cat is sick. And every window on Young Street opens and everybody starts yelling out what they think is correct. We have no clue if even any one of them is a vet. That's a little bit scary. That's one of my little pet peeves. <laughs> so when we come together like this, we can't take that smudge bowl around because the fire alarms would go off. But that's no excuse within us for not thinking with our hearts, speaking from our hearts, looking at things with our heart, listening with our hearts and letting everything go through this wonderful filter. And at our gathering yesterday with the UN Declaration, I offered to go to the UN and smudge every single person there. So we would all come together with one mind and understand, importantly, all heads are the same height. That means everybody is due equal respect, has equal say. Equality is very important. 
So having grown up as a young kid, as what was, when I was young, I was called a half-breed. Nowadays, it's mud blood, I think. Is that, that's, uh, no, that's Hogwarts. <laughs> it's Harry Potter, thank you. There's an implication that's still there, and I think I see this in a lot of our, 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 our things we see in movies where we're still trying to teach. We're using youth, even, to teach us. This is important, that there is a mix of people here. I'm not talking cultural dilution, I'm talking concepts of cultures that come together where we can share, just like teachers, one another and learn so much from each other. And that was kind of the heart of our discussion over there was not cultural dilution. And there's a phrase I come up with at the university a while ago in one of my lectures and that was very simple. I no longer say multiculture, I say interculture. What interculture says is there is a dialogue between not little silos. We have no problem making silos. Remember that in high school? Your little group you hung out with? You go to university now, we have 250 clubs on campus. Everybody goes from high school to another little silo. And that's important, those clubs are important. But let's work on that dialogue between. I think when we have a dialogue between each other, we can build something that's incredibly important. That is a relationship with one another. Until I know you, until I know what your interests are, until I know where you come from, until I know all kinds of things, and we can start really having a conversation. I think it's great to come together like this tonight, and thank you for my words. Thank you for listening to my words. I actually meant thank you for my words, because it comes from all of you as well. So miigwech, thank you. I'm going to dispense uh, Moy for introducing me. <laughs> I will introduce myself very quickly. Um, after uh, the... Uh, the uh, way that uh, Kat introduced himself. Uh, I'm Chinese. <laughs> My Chinese name is Yan Yan, not Lillian. I mean, many of you know me of Lillian. I was called Lillian because I went to an Italian nun school, and from the goodness of their heart, they make sure I have an English name so they can know what to call me. So, uh, and that's all good. And Yan Yan means cheerful, cheerful, okay? And my father's name is facing glory. So we are together, happy, happy, cheerful, cheerful, facing the glory of the trees. <laughs> There's a Chinese saying, yan yan heng wing, that's what it is, okay? So I'm very, very lucky because I have both my parents uh, together when I, I, and they had the right to marriage as is, uh, <laughs> as had been uh, awarded, uh, not awarded, as has been guaranteed by the, uh, UN, de the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I just want to say welcome, those are my few words. Um, my great pleasure to welcome you to the Human Rights at 70, um, our roundtable event in honor of the International Human Rights Day and the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Has this been said before that human rights deserve our attention more than ever before? I'm sure it has, but it bears repeating. And this year, even as uh, early as May, no, not May, March, March this year, um, I read a book called Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. I don't know if any one of you have read it. <laughs> oh, John did. And it's a hugely interesting uh, book. It was written after the Trump, uh, his success in, in be becoming the, the president of the United States. And uh, just, just from that book, it, it makes me, that book, the way it, 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 he wrote it, influenced me to work harder on race relations, work harder on understanding data, understanding reason, and not to give up, you know, when you see so many things happening. Uh, and according to a report released last month by Statistics Canada, hate crimes in this country reached an all-time high in 2017, with police across Canada reporting 2073 such incidents, an increase of 47% over the previous year. And, uh, you know, you look at what's happening, and you, you look at the, intoler the rise of intolerance and hatred from the back alley is now being brought to the main street of the public square. You can say, oh my God, you know, um, and 
Mr. Tam, Jim Tam, just reminded me that in 2020, the, this is what got me into the civil rights movement in the first place in 1979 when we had the campus giveaway program saying that foreign students are taking over U of T. And whenever they say foreign students, they show our face, including myself. And that's how they got me upset and I got into this work. And they are now saying all Chinese are spies, especially those who are in IT's and you cannot hire them, you cannot trust them. So it's the same thing after 40 years. Um, well, it was only last year in Charlottesville, Virginia, that racists marched with torches and swastikas flags proclaiming that the Jews will not replace us. Who ever heard of Charlottesville and such chants before August 2017 in the States? Probably not too many. It's about five, 900 kilometers from here if you drive uh, from here to uh, Charlottesville. And there should be seven decades away from such sentiments, but it is not. So this gives us an even more, more good reason to gather together tonight, to acknowledge, of course, the distance that we have traveled and the things we have accomplished. For instance, the charter, our human rights codes, the criminal code provisions, um, as well as the culture that continues to strive to meet the, the challenges, the ideals of multiculturalism, interculturalism, uh, diversity and inclusion, so as to create a society that is more equitable for all. A nation that acknowledges its errors, for instance, the internment of Japanese Canadians, the Indian residential schools, rejection of the MS in Lewis, the Chinese Hat Tax and Exclusion Act, just to name a few. None of which would have happened without advocates and educators driving societal change. But the UN Declaration of Human Rights actually deals with so many things, you know, a big, big roster, even social economic rights, property rights, blah, 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 and housing supply, um, food supply, health care, clean water, poverty, income inequality, unequal access to education and services that a just society should provide to all of us. These are human rights affronts no less serious than hate crimes um, against property and the person. They challenge us to do a better job and to strive towards a better Canada that is better for everyone. So we must realize that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights empowers us all. Our shared humanity is rooted in these universal values. We need equality, justice, and freedom to prevent violence and sustain peace. And we need to stand up together for our rights and the rights of other people. So thank you and welcome. Welcome to CICS. My name is Moi Wong Tam. I'm the Executive Director of Center for Immigrant and Community Services. Um, what we do is frontline services to newcomers in racialized communities. And we know there is a major intersection in terms of the people who are racialized minorities and newcomers in Canada. Um, therefore, this topic is, is dear to our heart as well. CICS is exactly 20 years younger than this UN Declaration of Universal Human Rights. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary this year. Um, we started way downtown as a very small uh, group of volunteers who saw the need for interpretation for a group of Chinese uh, people who couldn't speak English uh, or understand, understand um, what the uh, systems are about. So that was our origin. And over the years, we have moved and we've also changed, expanded our mandates. We're now a multicultural, multilingual service organization with uh, 20 languages on staff. Um, we have five locations in Toronto and three locations in York Region, mainly in Markham, uh, Markham area. And we're one of the uh, operators of one of the welcome centers in York, York Region. 
So CICS basically, in a nutshell, provides ser provide service to newcomers from language training to settlement services to uh, a range of services uh, where some of the newcomers and some are long-time immigrants who still couldn't access mainstream organizations. So we have actually services starting from prenatal classes to postnatal care to uh, children program, youth program, uh, to seniors program, as well as uh, uh, everything else in between for adult immigrants, such as employment services and so on. So, so much about CICS. Um, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's um, forum because we saw the election of a new government in Ontario a few months ago, and we have seen the speed with which changes have come, and they have come furiously, and they are, some of them are concerning. One of our, our funder, and funder of many organizations, is um, called MCI, Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration. It's now a directorate under a ministry called MCCSS, Ministry for Children, Community and Social Services. So we are worried that the voices of racialized minority may not be heard because there's no cabinet minister representing us at the cabinet table. Uh, similarly, we've also heard that in academia there has been changes or direct directives that changes be made. Um, basically, it's to curtail protest on campus and university are actually directed to uh, create so-called free speech policy based on a Chicago I believe it's a University of Chicago um, policy. I thought there are so many Canadian, uh, Canadian universities. Why do we need to go to the United States for a little policy? I don't understand that until you read the part about no protest on campus. And even student associations are also told um, certain things. And if you don't comply, I believe the penalty would be swift and it would be funding cuts. So these are some of the things that we can see happening now. Um, I'm sure there are other things happening in different circles, but people may be siloed and maybe not talking to each other and not able to um, address these issues uh, collectively. So this evening we're very privileged to have uh, several speakers who are going to share their insight with us, and I hope that after their presentation we will have good, lively table discussions. Um, so the first speaker, the keynote speaker that we have invited, um, is Mr. Raj Deer. He came to the Ontario Human Rights Commission from the Ministry of Attorney General's Civil Law Division. He was then overseeing 10 legal services uh, branches. As a portfolio director, he led the development of the Civil Law Division's Anti-Racism Action Plan and played a key role in coordinating indigenous legal advice on several high-profile matters for the government. Previously, Raj was the legal director at the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. He has also served as a deputy director in roles at the Ministry of the Attorney General, Crown Law Office, and the Ministry of Labor at the Litigation and Solicitor uh, Practices. Raj also spent 11 years as counsel at the OHRC, where he litigated and advised on a variety of human rights matters and appeared before administrative tribunals and at all levels of court, up to and including the Supreme Court of Canada. We're very privileged this evening to have uh, Mr. Raj Deer to speak to us. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Moi Tam, and thank you, Dr. Lillian Ma. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. It's a great honour to be here on behalf of the Ontario Human Rights Commission to reflect on our journey over the past 70 years with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge Toronto as a sacred gathering place for many Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. I also wish to recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis people in Ontario and show respect today to the Mississaugas of New Credit. And thank you as well, Elder Kat Krieger, for your welcome. It's amazing to think that on this night, exactly 70 years ago, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris, France. Now, 
on its surface, the Universal Declaration, which comprises of 30 articles and a preamble, seems simple enough. But make no mistake, this document was groundbreaking and revolutionary when it was created, and is a wonder to behold even today. Eleanor Roosevelt famously referred to it as the International Magna Carta of all men everywhere. And Pope John Paul II called the Declaration one of the highest expressions of the human conscience of our time. Among other things, the Universal Declaration tells us that the recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. That's a concept so fundamental to our understanding of human rights that it is referenced in the preamble of Ontario's Human Rights Code. A particular point of pride in this country is the fact that the first draft of the Universal Declaration was prepared by John P. Humphrey, a Canadian scholar, jurist, and human rights advocate. But even though Canada played a key role in enacting this landmark declaration, its own public attitudes were not keeping pace. And in the 70 years since the Universal Declaration was adopted, it's fair to say that we often have failed to realize the vision and promise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If we're going to evaluate where we are today in relation to the standards set in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then we need to understand how we arrived at this point. It's been said that you can't really look forward until you look back. And it's fitting that we're having tonight's roundtable at a moment in time when we are also looking back and commemorating the life of Viola Desmond, who is often referred to as Canada's Rosa Parks on the new $10 bill. In 1946, when Ms. Desmond had her historic experience in a new Glasgow theater in Nova Scotia, black students were not allowed to attend public schools with white students. Hotels, barbershops, stores, restaurants, parks and swimming pools had different rules for black people than for white people. In those days, if you bought a house, you often had to agree to a real estate covenant that your property would, quote, never be sold, assigned, transferred, leased, leased to, and would never be occupied by any person of the Jewish, Hebrew, Semitic, Negro, Negro or colored race or blood. In 1946, in the absence of a human rights code, it was still not clear that racial discrimination was illegal. There were some judgments that supported an individual's right to be free from discrimination based on race. But there were also judgments, including the infamous Supreme Court of Canada case, Christie versus York, which said that as an owner of a business, you had the right to serve, wh to serve whomever you wanted, meaning that you could discriminate. The courts had yet to reconcile these cases, and no court had ruled on the illegality of racial discrimination in hotels, theaters, and restaurants. That's what makes Viola Desmond's story so inspiring. In November 1946, Ms. Desmond, this petite, four foot 11 inch black woman weighing less than 100 pounds, refused to move from her seat in the main floor to the upper balcony in the area reserved for black people in a movie theater in Nova Scotia. Through her actions, she called out the racism she was experiencing and faced down an angry ticket seller, theater manager, police officer, and the magistrate. And in that moment, she wasn't just pu pushing back against a theater. She was pushing back against the entire establishment. And even though she was unsuccessful in challenging her conviction in the courts, Ms. Desmond's case mobilized the black community in Nova Scotia and generated sympathy in the local media 
ultimately resulting in the Nova Scotia government repealing its racial segregation laws in 1954. The Asian community has its own Viola Desmond. Ruth Lore Malloy, a Chinese Canadian born in Brockville, Ontario. Ruth Lore was a social work student who, along with others involved in the Canadian human rights movement, challenged service providers in Dresden, Ontario, that refused to serve racialized people. The black, Chinese, and Southeast Asian and Jewish communities stood together as allies to challenge the racism that was the norm of that period. The efforts of these human rights pioneers coincided and prompted a series of changes that occurred across Canada as people were coming to terms with the horrors of World War II, including the Holocaust against Jewish people, forced labor in the Asia Pacific, and here at home with the internment of Italian Canadians and Japanese Canadians, the redress of which led to the establishment of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. These changes set the stage for Canada's human rights movement. In 1947, Saskatchewan became the first province in Canada to introduce a Bill of Rights. Also in 1947, as Canada was playing a lead role in drafting the Universal Declaration, the federal government repealed the Chinese Immigration Act of 1923, which was also known infamously as the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented Chinese immigration to Canada for 24 years and kept families apart for decades. It also restored the right to vote to people of Chinese, Japanese, and South Asian backgrounds. After all, how could Canada promote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights while at the same time excluding particular ethnic groups based on race? In 1951, Ontario, the Ontario government, led by Conservative Premier Leslie Frost, passed the Act to Promote Fair Employment Practices in Ontario, and an act to ensure fair re remuneration for female employees. And later, in 1954, the Fair Accommodation Practices legislation. These acts would eventually be consolidated into the Human Rights Code, the first Human Rights Act in Canada. This also led to the creation of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. That first code prohibited discrimination in signs, notices, public accommodation, services and facilities, employment and trade union membership on the grounds of race, creed, color, nationality, ancestry, and place of origin. But there's more to building a culture of human rights than just having a code or a human rights system. When we look back at the experiences of Viola Desmond's and Ruth Lors, we realize that no steps forward, such as expanding the protections in human rights codes, happened because governments thought that they were nice things to do. These changes happened because of strong, unrelenting advocacy at the community level. Each advance is a hard-fought victory that begins with a spark from one person, like Viola Desmond or Ruth Lore, who had the courage and the leadership to call out racism or discrimination in that moment, which resulted in people with similar concerns getting together to collectively call for change. In this regard, I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the contributions in Ontario of other people, like Daniel Hill, Stanley Grizzle, Bromley Armstrong, Hugh Burnett, Hugh Doc Yip, Jean Lum, Alan Borovoy, and Irving Himmel, to name a few, who are all, all of them are human rights pioneers in their own right. Perhaps some of you here today have played a key role in advancing human rights protections in this country. When we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or when we honor Ms. Desmond's legacy we are celebrating our collective achievements in the struggle for human rights in Canada. Now, in the years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration, our society has obviously changed, 
and human rights code grounds have changed as well. Disabilities, sex, sexual orientation, family status, gender identity are just a few grounds that have been added to the Ontario Human Rights Code over the years. Another important advancement in human rights law was amending the code to recognize indirect and systemic discrimination in 1981. Systemic discrimination involves rules and practices that may seem neutral on their face, but actually have a negative impact on certain groups. All of these human rights advances are echoed or envisioned by the Universal Declaration, which has served as the foundation for two binding UN human rights covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The principles of the Declaration have endured and they are elaborated in international treaties such as the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the International Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and many more. But has the entire family in Ontario and Canada actually enjoyed these rights? The answer is no. For example, it wasn't until 1949 that legal restrictions used to control the movements of Japanese Canadians in Canada were removed. And although I mentioned that the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1947, it did not allow for family reunification until well into the 50s. Most egregiously is how Canada treated and continues to treat its First Peoples. While Canada was positioning itself as a human rights leader in drafting the declaration in 1948, nutrition scientists were conducting biomedical experiments on malnourished indigenous children and adults without their consent. While Ontario was setting up a human rights commission and creating the first human rights code in Canada, child welfare officials were removing large numbers of indigenous children from their families and placing them in state care. During the 60s scoop and long after, indigenous children were routinely placed into middle class European families, and the overrepresentation of indigenous children in the child welfare system continues today. And when Ontario was adding provisions for systemic discrimination or grounds like sexual orientation, indigenous children continued to live and often die in residential schools. These are just a few of the many ways Indigenous peoples have been left out of Ontario's vision for human rights. Even though the Universal Declaration and Ontario's Code recognize the need to address racism and racial discrimination, challenges remain. For every step forward, we've also experienced steps backward. For example, as we celebrate the decision to honour Viola Desmond on the $10 bill, we try to let go of painful memories of the Bank of Canada in 2012 erasing images on its $100 bill of an Asian woman after focus groups complained. For all of the strides that we've made on the journey towards racial equality, we continue to be reminded of the prevalence of racism in Canadian society. In 2008, following the Toronto Star's report of assaults against Asian Canadian anglers or fishers. The OHRC partnered with the Metro Chine Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Clinic to launch an inquiry. This province-wide inquiry began with a hotline that Asian Canadians could call into in Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian. The commission met with 21 organizations, uh, the OPP, York Region, uh, and Minister of Community and so, uh, uh, Correctional Services, uh, City of Kawartha Lakes, just to name a few, to identify solutions and obtained over 50 commitments from these organizations. Just two weeks ago, we received news from Statistics Canada that in 2017, police reported hate crimes in Canada rose sharply. The number was up 47% over previous years over the previous year. 
largely the result of an increase in hate-related property crimes, such as graffiti and vandalism. And a large number of these hate crimes occurred in Ontario and Quebec. And earlier today, the Ontario Human Rights Commission launched a collective impact. Our interim report on our inquiry into racial profiling and racial discrimination of black persons by the Toronto Police Service. The Commission's interim report focuses on a quantitative analysis of Special Investigations Unit data for cases that were open and closed during the period of 2013 to 2017. That is, criminal investigations into circumstances involving the police that have resulted in serious injury or death of civilians. It also focuses on a qualitative analysis of Special Investigation Unit Director reports over the same period, uh, which include the SIU Director's analysis of what happened in those interactions with black civilians and Toronto Police Service officers. The Commission also looked at certain legal decisions where there have been findings of racial profiling and racial discrimination and shared the results of its engagements with approximately 130 members of the black community. And I encourage all of you to read A Collective Impact. Suffice it to say that even just based on this initial work, the OHRC has sufficient cause for concern about racial profiling and racial discrimination against, uh, of black people in the use of force, stops, questioning and searches, and charges. The SIU data analysis confirms that black people in Toronto are more likely to have police force used against them, resulting in serious injury or death. In 2016, black people made up 8.8% of the Toronto population. But from 2013 to 2017, they made up 28.8% of police use of force cases that resulted in serious injury or death. 61.5% of police use of forces use of force cases that resulted in civilian death, and 70% of police shootings that resulted in civilian death. In the same period, a black person was 3.6 times more likely than a white person to be involved in police use of force cases that involved serious civilian injury or death, 11.3 times more likely to be involved in a deadly encounter with police, and 19.5 times more likely to be involved in a fatal police shooting. The SIU director's reports reveal the lack of a legal basis for police stopping black civilians in the first place, inappropriate searches and unnecessary charges or arrests. The director noted in a number of cases that are reviewed in the report that police did not notify the SIU, that the notification was delayed or that there was another problem with the notification such as misleading content, where findings were made of excessive force, such as, for example, in a case where a black man was pepper sprayed while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser and struck with a baton. Cases where race was a factor in stop and searches, for example, in the case of a black man who was on his way back from prayers when he was stopped by police, punched twice in the face, searched, handcuffed, and left in the cold and cases where there were findings of no reasonable and probable grounds to base an arrest. The results of the consultations with the black community provided perceptions that echoed the same findings that we saw in the quantitative data and in, in the some of the decisions of court uh, and tribunal. You know, perceptions of unnecessary stops, questioning and searches, excessive use of force, and unnecessary charges. And as we move forward with our inquiry, we have called on the Toronto Police, both the service and the board, to acknowledge that the interim report raises serious concerns and to mandate the collection and public release of race-based data. We, encourage, we continue to encourage the police to build human rights compliance, transparency and accountability into their day-to-day -day practices. And we will continue our inquiry to further examine these factors in police operations. So, after 70 years, 
of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, we've seen many, human, many advances in Ontario and, and we've seen some setbacks. Many who have made Ontario or Canada their second, third, or fourth home may not recognize that the rights and freedoms that we enjoy today were hard fought for by earlier generations. Through those efforts, the barriers to education, housing, employment, health care, and even the right to go to a movie or eat in a restaurant were removed. But there's still a lot of work to be done to truly realize the welcoming, inclusive society that was envisioned in the Declaration and the Human Rights Code. This is the responsibility that each of us must assume for the next generation. So I invite all of you to continue to share your ideas and your passion for making Canada and Ontario the kind of human rights leader that would make Viola Desmond, John Humphreys, or Ruth Lohr, or the many other human rights visionaries proud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj, for your inspiring words. And uh, we know that there are many many battles yet to be fought ahead of us. Um, we're going to invite to the podium A.V. Go shortly, one of the fearless uh, fighters in the community. A.V. Go is a lawyer and community activist on social, service just, uh, social justice issues. She was elected as a Bachelor of Law Society of Upper Canada, uh, a bencher of Law Society of Upper Canada in 2001, 2006, and again in 2013. She became the clinic director of the then Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. Now we dispense with Metro Toronto, it's Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. Um, it was a community legal aid clinic which provides free legal services to low-income individuals in the Chinese, Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian communities in the GTA. Um, AV Go is a recipient of many awards. I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, in 2012, she received the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers Lawyer of Distinction Award, and she became a member of the Order of Ontario in 2014. And just last month, despite her young age, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from OCASI, Ontario Council of Agency Serving Immigrants. And she also is a recipient of the Canada 150 Medal. Um, I'm going to and the podium over to Avi. Acknowledging the uh, traditional territories upon which we're gathered today, and to thank the indigenous communities for sharing the land with us in peace. And I also want to thank the organizer for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. And uh, Moy mentioned I work in the Leo Clinic. I'm, be I'm speaking as the clinic director of the Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. And apart from providing uh, direct services to low-income members of the communities, uh, we also engage in systemic advocacy, uh, test case litigation, and do a lot of uh, community education uh, and community mobilization. And I've been asked to talk about access to justice as a human rights issue, but I thought before I begin uh, my presentation, I do want to preface my a word comment by saying that when it comes to human rights, and I think many Canadians, we tend to kind of look to the South and say, oh, you know, look at them, we're not like them, uh, especially after Trump became the president. So while we may not have someone like Trump as our political leader, that certainly does not mean that uh, human rights uh, do, violations do not happen in Canada, and uh, Raj gave us a whole list of uh, those issues and look at the way that we treat our indigenous people. And often, even just like you know, yesterday, uh, if you read the uh, newspaper, uh, Canada was at the International Migration uh, Conference in Morocco, and we signed on to some kind of a declaration. Right away, there is like, you know, some far-right group uh, organizing protest uh, against the Canadian for signing uh, the declaration that respect the rights of migrants. So we really need to be kind of uh, remind ourselves that we may not be exactly like the Americans, but we're not too far off. And we also need to be aware of the hidden systemic racism 
that is very pervasive in Canada, and I know some of the other speakers will address those issues as well. Uh, I'm speaking um, about access to justice, so I will start by talking about some of the barriers that many of our communities and clients face in accessing the justice system. And I will then speak the, uh, shortly, uh, you know, briefly about a project that we're doing right now that talks about this issue. So, um, as I mentioned, I work in a legal, cl legal clinic, so a lot of our clients are low income. Uh, many are uh, immigrants, refugees, uh, or people with precarious status or no status in Canada. And many of them will be non-English speaking because that's the, the focus of our community, of our service. Um, and, and all of them will be racialized. And so as racialized individuals, many of our clients ex experience systemic racism uh, in different aspects of their lives. Uh, but they also um, experience systemic uh, discrimination on the basis of their immigration status as well. Uh, some of them face domestic violence uh, challenges as uh, women fleeing violence. Many have mental health issues. Like All of those issues make it uh, far more difficult for them to access uh, the legal services and to get appropriate help. And all of them, all of them have very limited understanding of the laws in Canada and the legal system. Um, and they, you know, on top of all that, they face linguistic barrier in accessing legal services and, and legal system. And many would require interpretation services when they appear before a court or tribunal. So a lot of the issues that we face, uh, the clients face, uh, are in the area of housing, immigration, social assistance, employment, um, and many of these issues are actually adjudicated before the administrative tribunal as opposed to the court. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, while they may require interpreters, but many of the tribunals actually do not uh, re um, uh, provide interpretation service as of right. Uh, some of them, you can, you know, if you know how to find it uh, on their website, you may be able to apply for an interpreter, but uh, the whole is the, the process is not transparent. And even um, many of the people who would require the service would not know how to find the service. And tribunal and courts in general also do not collect uh, the demographic data and information about their users. So for instance, they would not know of the people who are appearing before them without any representation. How many are racialized groups? How many have immigration status? How many women? And so on and so forth. And nor do they have any data on how many of the users of the tribunal and court would require accommodation, whether it's because of their linguistic barriers or because of their disabilities. And as we all, like if you have been um, or try to access the legal system before, you know that the first thing you may have to do is to fill out some form. And some of these forms are, you know, simple, but most of them are not. And so for the clients that we serve, a lot of them can't even fill out that simple form to access the court or the tribunal. And I know that many of them will try to come to uh, community agencies like CICS and other social service agencies and settlement agencies to get help. But because of the funding limitation, many of these agencies will not be able to assist uh, these clients. And some of the staff will not have the training to do so. And I know that many of my clients, what do they do? They end up paying some, you know, private companies uh, they find online and, you know, they go there, they pay a lot of money and they're getting very poor services and, you know, have their case, like, you know, screw up the case and then they will come to us for help. So, um, but that's because the way that they access information uh, is not necessarily the same way that we access information. And many of the courts and tribunals themselves would not have accessible information that you can, you know, get. So they, many of the people that we serve would not know how to access. They would not even know that they have a right to appeal if they are being denied housing or social assistance and so on and so forth. And so a lot of them face challenge just in knowing when to seek help. Another challenge, um, you know, that we don't always talk about is the issue of around unconscious bias within the justice system. So men, I would say that uh, while there are, you know, we are increasingly seeing more representation of racialized groups, indigenous people, 
uh, women and so on within the tribunal and the court system. But by and large, uh, it is still not reflective of the population that we that make up Canada. And a lot of these uh, tribunal members, court judges, may not understand the systemic and other challenges faced by these low-income folks. So, you know, they, their decision-making power uh, or the way that they make decision is not informed uh, by this, uh, this kind of information. So in 2007, our clinic uh, was, along with several other clinics and also OCASI, uh, received funding from the Law Foundation uh, of Ontario to try to look at how racialized groups are accessing uh, the tribunal system. And we want to face, uh, focus on racialized communities because we know the various challenges uh, that this community face. Um, and uh, so we do a lot of research, um, look at other jurisdictions and what they are doing, but we also do a survey which I want to share with you the result. So in a survey conducted at a conference at OCASI, which is the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, last year, so we asked the agency, so these are agency staff, um, about their clients' access to the tribunal system. So of the people who responded to the survey, 88% answered yes to the question whether their organization received inquiries from clients who are dealing with legal issues that seem appropriate for uh, an administra administrative tribunal to deal with. But only 56% reported knowing where a client could go for more information. And when they were asked about perceptions regarding uh, barriers and access to the tribunal for people of color, 80% strongly agreed or agreed that the ability of clients to access tribunal um, in person was an obstacle. 92% strongly agreed or uh, agreed that a lack of support for parties that don't have legal counsel or legal assistance is a barrier to justice for people of color. And 100% strongly agreed or agreed that the accessibility of written information or and or availability of interpreter services is important for clients with linguistic barriers. So these, uh, this is just one of you know the many surveys that we do, but it shows that there is a huge barrier uh, for uh, many communities in accessing the administrative tribunal. But what does it mean from a human rights point of view that you know that's the com conversation we're having today? First of all, I think when we're thinking about people who are most in need because they have the greatest challenges in access to uh, justice, uh, they are also the very same people who are most likely to have their human rights violated. Um, women, people of color, indigenous people, people of, uh, with disability and so on. But by failing to make the justice system accessible to these individuals who need society's protection the most, our legal system is, in effect, perpetuating the systemic discrimination that they face. And secondly, while the clinic, uh, sorry, while the legal system may not be um, fully able to address the underlying systemic discrimination that perme permeates our society, the system should and can change to make it more accessible for the marginalized. So, adopting a human rights lens, I think what we need to do is to try to encourage the justice system. Uh, to adopt the race, uh, gender analysis lens, uh, looking at how the system can be transformed to ensure that all people living in Ontario, regardless of the background, will have equal access to justice. Thank you. Thank you, A.V. Our next speaker is Michael Carr. Michael is a community development worker and equity and human rights advocate. He's currently serving as coordinator with Color of Poverty, Color of Change, the racial justice education and advocacy network in Ontario. He also teaches at Seneca College in the social service worker program. Michael has worked in a number of capacities with several newcomer settlement and refugee advocacy groups and organizations over many years, as well as being active in a broad spectrum of equity, human rights, and racial justice advocacy efforts and community-based campaigns. He was the founding coordinator of the National Anti-Racism Council of Canada, uh, NARC, uh, from 20, uh, 2001 to 2006. Michael? Um, and firstly, as others have done, I would certainly want to acknowledge the, the hospitality and the, the reception of the uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit in, in, in allowing us the use of the, these lands, these territories. Um, and, and thank 
Elder Krager for, for having opened us up in, in a good way this evening uh, to allow for a good conversation. Um, and also, uh, in, in that same spirit, acknowledge the, uh, the relevance and the, the importance in this conversation of uh, the, the, the many treaties that, that, are, that are relevant to, to these lands and territories, all the way from the, uh, the, the um, dish with one spoon covenant between the uh, Anishinaabe na peoples and allied, allied nations, uh, in treaty with uh, the Haudenosaunee peoples, the, the Iroquois Confederacy, um, through to the uh, Treaty of Niagara and the Royal Proclamation of 17, 1763, and all the subsequent treaties um, that are, again, relevant to these lands and territories because it's, it's so important, uh, particularly in light of the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that all of us, all of us that don't self-identify as indigenous uh, to these lands and territories, all the rest of us, whether we arrived to Canada last week or whether we're 10 generation sed settler Canadian, all of us are treaty people and we have, tr we have responsibilities and we have obligations. And I think that's one of the many calls to action of, of the TRC that uh, it is our obligation to, to understand the those treaties and understand what is what are our roles in, in, in light of those treaty obligations. And so that's one of the pieces of work that Color of Poverty, Color of Change does as um, we just came through our, our 10 year anniversary. We aren't quite as long in the tooth as CICS or and certainly not, not the UD, UD, UDHR. Um, but uh, as part of that 10 year anniversary, uh, we had a series of conversations around the province that, that uh, in light of the 150th anniversary of Canada, uh, Canada as, as a country, of course, we wanted to have a, 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 a conversation around reconciliation and racial justice. So we convened gatherings in different places around the province to bring together uh, members of indigenous communities and member, members of, div of similarly diverse peoples of color to ha have a critical conversation about that 150th moment, or as Elder Krieger reminded us, the, the, the 15,000 year moment in, in light of uh, the presence on these lands and territories of First Peoples. And flowing from those series of conversations around the province, we had uh, a province-wide gathering earlier this year as part of our 10th anniversary to, to in some ways ha have a summary of those conversations and have a, a going forward conversation as we have done each, each sort of five years of our existence to try to plot our course um, that was in a, in a pre-election moment, uh, pre-provincial election, and of course subsequently the, the, pre, the municipal election, around what, what should be our priorities, what should be our uh, immediate policy program and other objectives for our ongoing education and advocacy work. And, and that's where we, we identified the, the absolute necessity to, to always center our work uh, around the 94 calls to action, and, and one of first among many, but there are so many that could be lifted up as priority. Uh, the, the full implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, one of that, those, those suite of international human rights instruments that Raj referred to earlier that is so critical and important for our, our national journey going forward. Uh, and certainly our federal government has committed to its, its full implementation, uh, but we're far from that at the present moment, and it's, it's up to us in all of our again, our education and advocacy work to make, to, to make that commitment real, uh, to, 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 see it, to see it done and done consistently over time. The, the, other, the other things that we've identified as so critical to addressing poverty, but poverty th through the lens that we've adopted all the way through now the 11 plus years of color of poverty, color of change, uh, through a social or structural determinants of health approach where we recognize that there are so many different drivers of inequity and drivers of disparity, drivers of disadvantage when it comes to uh, racialized groups, whether we're talking about indigenous peoples or peoples of color. 
and the the way in which we try to lift that up and make it visible and, and try to build transparency around the nature of, of those drivers of inequity, we recognize the absolute necessity, and, it, we, and that's why one of, the, one of the main reasons we welcomed the, the initial recommendations flowing from the report released today by the OHRC around the, the absolute necessity, the critical need for disaggregated data collection um, in terms of when, where and wherever it is possible to do so across every provincial ministry, every, every municipal authority, uh, and every uh, federal government uh, rele relevant jurisdiction, that systems be put in place that allow for people, the opportunity for people to self-identify if they choose on the basis of a range of socio-demographic uh, dimensions of their identity. And be because if we don't have that, if we don't have that kind of transparency to make visible the, the kinds of inequities and disparities that exist across a whole range of areas of public policy and shared concern, then, there's, there, there, then that, that becomes invisible. That, 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 that no longer effectively exists in the mind's eye of politicians, in the mind's eye of policymakers, in the mind's eye of social commentators and, and, and the media. So, one of our, our focuses is this idea of disaggregated data collection. That's why in the present moment, it's so critical in light of some of the concerns that Moy drew, drew attention to in, in terms of the, where some of the early initiatives are of our new provincial government. We really have to ensure the, the full integrity of the anti-racism directorate, um, because there's a, there's, it's certainly among many other initiatives of earlier governments uh, that entity is similarly at risk, but but what one of the initiatives that is, is uh, the focus of their current work is wrapped around what they've developed as what they call a data standard, which, which is a template for application across all of all of government at a provincial level to allow for and provide for the uh, well ultimately across all of government, but currently piloted across child welfare education. And, and, and justice and policing um, to uh, allow for that kind of uh, data gathering so that the kinds of reports that were released earlier today can become more consistently done. Um, and over time, as those disparities and inequities are made more visible, uh, then those of us involved in, in community change and, and activism work or uh, program and service delivery can better address those needs more and much more effectively so because we, we, we know them better and, and know how to uh, effectively target our resources to bring about meaningful change. Um, and the other thing of the two handouts that I circulated, and, uh, I guess there was a beige colored one and an orange colored one and I think there are copies at your tables. Just to uh, highlight uh, some of the some of the simple findings that one, what, that one can generate with, with that kind of access to data. Uh, the, the beige handout, on one side with, with the, the numbered chart, you'll see on the, the column on the far right, uh, the, the different rates of poverty, and again, the, the different ethno-racial groupings that are listed on the, on the left-hand column are the standard reporting categories of Statistics Canada, and, and they're, they're we have to say they're problematic as they stand because they're a, an odd mix of ethno-specific and regional grouping, which uh, in some ways makes no sense, but in other ways actually hides uh, disparities and inequities within those, those different uh, regional groupings or uh, racialized groupings. But e even with those qualifications, You'll, it's very evident when you look at the right-hand column the kinds of inequities and disparities. And of course, this is just looking at the indicator of poverty across the province of Ontario. So these are province-wide aggregate numbers. Uh, when you look at different ethno-racial groups or groupings, and the, rate, uh, the, the risk or the rate of poverty within each of those. But if you do any other indicator, whether it be health or education or justice and policing, etc., you will find the same kind of color-coded disparity. And, la and on, the, on the opposite side, with the bar charts, the vertical bar charts, uh, you'll see something that often doesn't get, get recognized, 
uh, but I think it's important also to, to look at the numbers this way. If you think of all communities of color across the province as one group, uh, and think of that as 100%, and then you break that out uh, by, on the basis of what percentage of that 100% are from those various ethno-specific groups, you'll see that the, those that have the largest number of people living in poverty are, are South Asian Ontarians and Chinese Ontarians. So I'll, I'll leave that with you just to, to think about in terms of how you might go forward in, in your work, in terms of how, how you might be able to lift this up and use that in your program and advocacy. And always, wherever we go, we always draw attention to, and I notice employment is one of the discussion table topics, the absolute need for provincial employment equity in the province of Ontario, because we can get into this conversation later, but, but the federal act, the Federal Employment Equity Act, which is now 32 years old, um, only covers about 12 to 13 percent of Ontario labour market. That means 87 to 88 percent of workplaces and employers across Ontario have no such employment equity obligations. So that's why we need that complementary initiative at a provincial level. So I'll leave those thoughts with you to carry forward to the evening. Last but not least, we have Mr. Moringa. He's currently Vice President of Housing and Homelessness Services as a Sustainability and Development at Wood Green Community Centre. You can read up on his bio. And we want to, uh, we're a little behind time, so I want to leave all the time uh, for us to hear from him. He has a very rich and extensive educational training background and uh, all kinds of interesting international experience. So we'd like to hear from him. Read about his bio on the brochure. So, um, like everybody, my, uh, my acknowledgments of the uh, generosity of the people of the First Nations for allowing us in this country to live in peace and, and to prosper, uh, even as we confront challenges that we continue to have. So my subject matter today is, uh, is housing. It was um, heartening to hear the work that the Ontario Human Rights Commission is doing um, during the early 2000s, I guess it's now 18 years ago, I worked for an organization called the Center for Equality Rights and Accommodation and uh, together with champions of housing human rights like Bruce Porter, we were able to score some f fairly significant systemic changes around issues of discrimination in housing income discrimination um, and so it's good to see that that work continues in a very powerful way. Um, so I, I'm going to begin the story about housing by actually saying that we actually, those of us who have been in housing for a little bit uh, feel like we need to celebrate for some of the good news that has come our way lately. Um, housing has felt like the forgotten cousin in uh, social policy for a while. And of course, nobody can compete with health. But lately, we have had some victories. And this, these victories are, for the most part, the function of people getting together, organized, uh, and into uh, making deputations to uh, the Liberal government, uh, resulting in the fr first national housing strategy that we've had in this country for a long time. And I bring that up because a key part of that component is the recognition of housing as a right. And that is unprecedented for a government in Canada to, to bring that out uh, in a very clear way, which in a way means that we're acknowledging that access to housing is not just a money issue and that underlying the conversation about housing is a whole different systemic barriers that people face in order to earn, uh, uh, in order to provide or have a decent place to live. And, and that's sort of the segue that um, I, want to, um, I want to bring it here. So the acknowledge, kudos to the acknowledgement of the need for a safe, affordable housing for everyone in Canada. Clearly, there is work to be done there. The, um, the national housing strategy has brought housing back into the public policy arena, but it is also accompanied 
by a drive towards legislation so that those uh, statements of, uh, the statement of uh, safe, affordable housing for all uh, actually has legislative teeth and a significant amount of investment from the government in the form of $40 million or so, $40 billion or so. Sometimes I can't tell the difference uh, to put in housing. It's not, for the most part, a lot of money, to be honest, and the way it's being put together, you know, there's all kinds of barriers for many of us who work in community services, but it's something to celebrate. However, even as we celebrate, um, we have some significant challenges. And before I go into what some of those key issues is, because I don't want to take up too much time, I want to visit, I don't know those of you who watch TV sometimes and watch show, uh, conversations about housing and affordable housing, um, some myths there that are sometimes uh, perpetrated. One of them is the myth about um, that we have a shortage of uh, uh, supply in, 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 this, in the greater Toronto area. We haven't had, uh, in the last 20 years, the highest number of housing built. We haven't had as much housing built in the, uh, in the last 20. We've had more housing built, I should be more affirmative, in the last 20 years than we've had in the previous 40 years before that, right? So what is all this clamoring about supply? And I'll come back to that. The second myth is that rent control is what is messing up uh, 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 and, and providing a, a disincentive for the supply of new uh, rental housing. That too is a myth. We have not had effective rent control in this province since the 1990s, since 1990. And so this whole notion that because we have rent controls, uh, that's what you know is problematic is not true. Everybody who's built a new rental unit since 1990 could charge whatever they wanted when they started the first day, right? The only thing that had to be controlled is once you start renting your unit at $10,000 or whatever, and I exaggerate, you can't come back the next year and say to somebody, next year it's $15,000. Like, that's not a tenable way of, uh, of, of, of living. It's not, it's so, that's how rent control was allowed to, so that it keeps pace with inflation. Because if I'm living in your home and you're charging me that, the next year you come and double it, I don't go to my, uh, my employer and say double my employment, uh, my, my check, so that I can meet that. So it was just, just totally uh, preposterous to, to, uh, to argue that that should be removed. Be that as it may, the provincial government has decided to then create another exemption class of people who have built new housing after November 20, uh, uh, 2018 um, so that they too can charge whatever they want the first year, the second, and the third year. We haven't got there yet, but um, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. In any case, so those are two myths, and you hear about them. What is the problem, though? Um, we do have a problem. And the problem that we have is the problem that is generally called affordability. But behind the affordability problem is people, right? Is, uh, is people, right? Um, and just to give you a sense from a numbers point of view, the average rent in Toronto today for a two bedroom is $1,400. Average, right? You'll be lucky to find it, you have to hunt for it. The average shelter allowance for a four member family under the Ontario, in, in the, in the um, Ontario Works or, or Social Assistance is $756. That is not a 30% gap of affordability, like people say. That is almost twice. How you actually manage to live is another story. So when I focus on these numbers, I'm trying to say that the affordability question is, is primarily the one that hits people who are low income. Most of those people are immigrants. Most of those people are visible minorities. Most of those people are vulnerable elderly seniors, and most of those people are young people. So 
we have a, a really critical mass of people who, uh, who are facing a serious affordability problem. And that affordability problem has, of course, been caused by just neglectful policy, actually careless policy, that from 1990 allowed the rents to inflate, to rise way faster than what we all earn, um, all, all earn. For the first time, on a square footage basis, the cost of rent is higher than the cost of a mortgage per square footage. So that is just preposterous. In any case, so that's number one. We have an affordability problem that impacts racialized minorities, immigrants, and I've provided that list. And that's where the conversation needs to focus on. So how do we create conditions in order to address that? It reminds me of exactly the same conversations that we used to have 20 years ago about discrimination in housing. This is effectively discrimination in housing, uh, uh, which is supported by an economic structure of how we access uh, rent. It's supported by a certain class of people who, whose voice supersedes others in deciding what we do and reflected in the kind of uh, 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 approach that we're seeing with the provincial government today. So the second thing um, I want to talk about in terms of housing is the voices that are allowed or heard in order to inform the problem and to inform the solution. I gave you the example of a lot of uh, talk about supply. Well, that is primarily driven by developers who are trying to create piggyback on a crisis of affordability by suggesting that they need to be completely, uh, uh, to have no rules of the game for them, set for them. And secondly, for the city of Toronto to give them a carte blanche uh, a ticket to develop housing the way they want to develop it, without standards, without anything. We already know how much people pay for, uh, even for those rents that are, the other day they said that a 500 square foot, which is the size of here to over there in a condominium now is renting for 2,000 bucks, right? So you can see where not having any standards starts to go. But this, these are the voices that are being listened to. I was, um, I was giving an example of why we need to not, uh, why we need to have rent control one time. And I used the example of Shannon Martin who is an employee of CBC, who experienced exactly the same kind of uh, thing. And it's interesting how that played out in terms of a voice. It was beautiful, the way she put the story. Um, and you know, several months later, the Liberals came up with a fair uh, housing plan. And I was asking myself, after those of us who have advocated for housing for all these years, and, 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 and you know what the line was? my kids can't afford to live in Toronto anymore. That was what I, the minister said. And I said, really? Those are the voices you're listening to. And you know what? No, no, I don't have an issue with that. My own son is uh, living downtown, sharing a 500 square footage, right, uh, uh, with, with his friends. But it, it just comes to, to, to speak to whose voices are heard. And it's extremely important, as we assemble here, to remember to keep our voice in front of the issue. Because otherwise, you get issues that we have being used to, to solve other people's problem or to perpetuate uh, wealth in other people's pockets. The third issue that in housing is a big problem for us is when you have that situation, the only resort that people have is to go to social housing. Now, social housing has been neglected for the last 30 years. The quality of social housing is, for the most part, uh, really wanting. Most of the people who live in social housing are newcomers, visible minorities, and elderly people who are vulnerable. Again, the same kinds of issues start continue to impact the same groups of people that those of us who are working in the anti-discrimination field faced uh, were dealing with 20 years ago. And the last thing is that we have to for remember, and I say this to people in housing, that we can't solve the problem of housing alone, and that in fact, the issue of housing is connected to employment, 
is connected to health. So while we celebrate that we have a $40 billion fund out there, we have to remember that at the same time, the province of Ontario is freezing minimum wages and, and making it difficult for people who are low income to pay those rents that are already exorbitant. And so I love the presence of all of these components in this room here today so that we can continue to have this conversation in an integrated way and not be siloed off into different things, into different components of, of the problem. So I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you very much for the privilege of allowing me to come and speak and um, hope we can have this conversation out on the floor there. Thanks. Now, after all the presentation, it's time for us to talk, everybody here. Um, can I ask all the facilitators at each table to raise your hand? I just want to make sure there is a facilitator at every table. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anybody over there? Pan? Okay, we've got volunteers. I'm sure you can find a volunteer at your table. Um, we need a facilitator. A note taker, somebody who can write legibly because we want to collect the notes from, from your discussions. And if you can also ask one of you to report back, maybe in one or two minutes at the end. Um, we have about 30 minutes for discussion and uh, hopefully we can end before 9.15. So the discussion will end at uh, 9 o'clock sharp. If you need less time, we'll uh, convene sooner. It's going to be overboard, and they are not actually in this. I mean, they are main sources of education rights, but they do not deserve to see anything on any European we should say as a strategy around community gardens or people. Right. One of the uh, kind of interesting uh, comments that came up was that, that many newcomers have a fear of the authorities, and that acts as a roadblock to them accessing or what shall I say, protecting their rights. Um, sorry, I'm reading somebody else's writing here. Good, good writer, but just foreign to me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, these things can be um, helped somewhat by education um, and by by that we mean changing the public perception of a process or an institution um, to make the, those more accessible and understood by everybody. Clear language helps in that too. Um, but uh, that's the fundamental problem and we didn't really come up with a total solution on how to address it. But that, the fear of authorities drives a lot of new immigrants away from uh, exercising rights that they might have. Uh, and therefore protecting their, their own human rights. Um, the second question we had was, uh, while domestic violence affects all communities, women from racialized communities often suffer in silence and face additional struggles in finding support. How do we ensure that victims from racialized communities, including immigrants and refugees, can access protection offered by the legal system? And uh, we... Uh, focused on the fact that um, in a really bitterly ironic twist, um, uh, many women, particularly who are not uh, uh, conversant with English fluently, uh, find themselves in domestic uh, violence situations being charged themselves and their partner not being charged. Um, so clear, and obviously one of the we think, or, you know, I mean, it's not the total answer to why that happens, of course, but one of the problems with that is it's simply a lack of ability to um, hear both sides. 
and the, if, the voice, if the woman's voice is silenced because she doesn't speak English properly, in most situations, I don't know about Toronto, but in most situations there is not um, the translation ability uh, or availability si uh, available simultaneously to when the police are answering the call. Um, the third question we had was, what innovative means or changes can we adopt in order to improve access to justice? Uh, um, well, we thought that um, uh, an, a better, a greater awareness of uh, human rights uh, is required, uh, sort of at, at all levels, particularly um, governmental or decision-making levels, and that it would be a worthwhile thing for all of those to have a, um, a HR audits done on their policies and, and laws and bylaws, and that going, this would be a retroactive thing, and that going forward, any new policies or uh, laws would have the human rights uh, filter put on them before they were actually enacted. And that was our three questions. Good evening, everyone. My name is Akua. I was at the health and housing table. Um, so I'm just going to quickly like summarize the questions we had just because we have it from two areas. Um, so first we talked about health. So the significant challenges to racialized minorities and immigrants accessing health care. So we spoke specifically about Indigenous communities and how um, we felt that, particularly with the Truth and Reconciliation Act, that colonial and oppressive um, essentially ties and practices like weren't weren't 100% acknowledged. Um, we felt that a lot of the victims of residential schools were just given money, but the actual systemic issues of why that money was needed to be given in the first place was never actually addressed. Um, and then such oppressive acts as the Indian Act and the um, Crown Indigenous Affairs Commission um, with the federal government um, actually hasn't been putting in enough money for the programs and services, and if they do, they're very temporary. Um, so this essentially just allows the cycle of poverty to continue. Um, the second question we had was why, essentially, mental illness is an important determinant of health, yet there are chronic and systemic issues with the newcomer experience. So we talked about how um, a lot of individuals, especially um, the ones that we were at our table, um, we find that a lot of immigrants who are coming to Canada, they're from countries where mental health and illness is not particularly talked about. Um, I talked about the experience the black experience, where in the black community it's not talked about a lot as well. So when you're finding people are coming to Canada and they are starting to have mental health illnesses, they're not able to find someone in their racialized community in which they can talk to and that actually really allows them to connect and actually aids in the recovery process. So we found that this was a fault in our healthcare system because there isn't enough representation for people to actually feel like they have someone to talk to who can help them cope um, in a cultural, um, in a more of a cultural way. The next was, how do we ensure our voices are heard in policy and public funding? Um, so we found that the people who are actually um, most heard when it comes to funding models within the provincial government actually sit on the health boards and our hospital executives, primarily of which of our cisgender white men, and we know that that is actually not indicative um, of the population in Canada. So we find that this is actually very problematic because a lot of hospital executives do not have intersectional and or multicultural executive boards, yet they are the ones making the decisions on behalf of all the people who use those services, which is very problematic. And then um, second for housing, we found that the most significant challenges to racialized minorities and immigrants um, accessing rental housing, accessing the rental housing market and or home ownership was that um, these individuals are often discriminated based on color, their lack of credit and or references if they're coming from a country and then are setting up themselves here. Um, we find that there are a lot of instances where you will see immigrants who have like engineering and doctor degrees back in their countries, yet they come here and they can't find work because we don't value, we don't value their education the same as that we did back home, which is absolutely um, wrong. So we're actually um, reducing our labor force by not actually allowing those credentials to be passed. Um, and so we also felt that this also is discriminatory because police also discriminate those individuals the same way landlords do when they actually decide who gets to rent their services. 
And then the last question we had was on the government of Canada's national housing strategy. Um, and so essentially we need to hold the federal MPPs accountable to how much, um, to, to actually where and how much affordable housing is being implemented across Canada when it comes to the $44 billion that was um, talked about that was being um, allocated for this resource. We also talked about how municipal governments also need to ensure that the lands for affordable housing that are going to be invested, they actually can be rented by the people who live in that community. So if I'm living somewhere in Scarborough where the average household family income is $50,000 or less, I should not be living next to or see a um, condo being built where I'm going to be renting for at least $2,000. That's just, it's just not congruent. Um, so yeah, that's what you talked about. Thank you. We did not deal with the third question, which deals with finding measures to remove financial barriers for racialized youth who um, want to go to a post-secondary, and that's because we had lots to talk about in our first two questions. First question, what are the biggest issues related to discrimination in Ontario schools and how can they be uh, eliminated or reduced? And part of that leads into the second question, which were part of the rights to education involve having schools that are safe, environment free from bullying, discrimination, and threats of violence. And how do we deal with that? Among the points we looked at were our, our view that most curriculum doesn't have enough to do, doesn't deal much with the issues that we've been dealing with this evening. We decide that's a bad thing. Um, if curriculum is supposed, and we think curriculum is supposed to have a moral purpose among all the other things you, you do, which involves teachers and involves students, both learning and both being free to say their, to say their piece. Um, students are almost trained not to speak. Um, we, that should be changed. And the, we also recognize that it's not just, um, the issues are more than just people who look like me compared to people who don't look like me. The, the, because we are a diverse society, we have lots of issues um, dealing with the various peoples who, who live in this country who've come here or, or started here. Um, I pointed out that when I was young, uh, the biggest issues in this city were Protestant and Catholic. Uh, that has largely changed. So it's possible for this other stuff to change as well, but we've got to work at it, and it's going to take a while. Thank you very much. Uh, how is the rise of nationalism and the alt-right affecting civil rights in Canada? What are the main areas of civil rights that are under attack? What are some tools and ways we can use to preserve civil rights in Ontario and Canada? To answer these questions briefly, everything is under attack, okay? And it's under attack because, through, uh, uh, because of something that one of our uh, table mates uh, referred to an insidious process. Ultimately, groups have been set one against another. And as they're set against each other, uh, by first encouraging and then being victimized by uh, special interest styles of politics, Okay, ultimately, the ability for these groups to come together and combine on issues that really should bring us together has been severely impaired, indeed damaged. So, for example, okay, we have exclusion. We have groups that are shown up as being somehow less worthy of civil rights than others, be it because of religion, be it because of immigrant, immigration status, is largely irrelevant because the mechanism is the same. Okay. When uh, governments in Ontario, for example, move to uh, somehow unprotect or disprotect, if you will, uh, the green belt, right, we can be sure that the housing that's going to be built there is not going to be low-cost housing. Right? Okay. Who is going to oppose this? Well, clearly the people who need low-cost uh, housing, but other folks who don't right, see this as being an advantage. Lo and behold, I don't have to spend $3 million for my house. I can get one for $1.5 million. I'm okay, right? For everyone else, well, too bad and so sad. What is the solution to all this? The solution is, goes right back to square one, and that is coalition building. We require education in order to remind us that the civil rights and the human rights that we have gained, right, were not gained simply for us, but rather were gained for everybody. 
We need education to remind us that we are stronger when we work together, and we require the ability through education and through common sense to put aside our separate communal agendas in order to work together for the common good, because without the common good, okay, then good will be increasingly uncommon. Thank you. So uh, the questions we had were, what are the co most common discriminations facing racial, uh, racialized minorities in the workplace? What are the barriers to advancements or opportunities for racialized minorities? And what are the top three potential solutions? Um, so some of the points we came up with. Um, so um, racialization in the, in the employment field doesn't just apply to immigrants. So it's not just about um, lack of community experience or communication skills, because even second or third generation um, racialized employees get stereotyped, right? Um, like uh, Chinese people are good at math, or Indian people are good at IT, or something like that. Um, so, um, and, and part of that, one of those persistent stereotypes is that we're not good uh, managers, we're great worker bees, right? Um, great technical skills you would see in the performance appraisal, but, but uh, you know, you don't get the career advancement opportunities. And one example I can kind of point to from the education field is um, all university and colleges now have entrepreneurship incubators. Go visit them. See who are the students there. Um, you see they're mostly white, but not all. You'll see uh, a number of South Asians and Asians, but you'll hardly ever see any, any black or indigenous or Hispanic students in those incubator spaces, right? Um, and the, the, another part of this kind of interaction between management and employees is that um, senior management doesn't value ideas that are different coming from racialized employees, right? So if their ideas very much align with the existing direction and existing strategy, they welcome it. But if you bring an idea from a different cultural background, they're not valued at all. Um, so what we're saying, and, and the issues are often individualized. They're saying, hey, the problem is with you, the racialized min minority. Okay, go improve your communication skills, and here's a course for you. But there's no recognition of the structural barriers so when we're moving to the solutions, uh, one of our solutions is recognize the structural barriers and structural issues and don't individualize this on us, uh, on, on the racialized minorities. Um, and a lot of um, promotions kind of take place informally and through acting appointments and, and, and temporary assignments. And those go, often go to um, privileged and dominant groups. So there, there has to be a lot more transparency in how those temporary assignments and opportunities to prove yourself are, are, are given out to um, people who are different. And um, yeah, so, so, so let's end there. There are lots of notes on, on these points. Thank you. So I know we're in the home stretch. We talked about poverty and income equality. And we, some of the strategies, uh, we talked about the strategies and the measures to reduce the rate of people returning to social assistance after they've left. So under poverty strategies, we talked about the importance of looking at housing, health, and employment, taking up from the last speaker. Uh, raising the minimum wage would stimulate the economy. Having uh, rent control and affordability as a main concern. Looking at community gardens uh, and food security initiatives taking a closer look at what is considered low income by region, essentially, uh, making training and education more accessible, and make it, making it easier for people to work from home. So those were some of the ideas that we talked about. And then in terms of re reducing, we talked about um, reducing precarity and, and helping people to find jobs, but also developing skills and knowledge for the changing economy. Uh, more focus on trade schools rather than universities. And we need more incentives for people in the workforce because they're, right now we discussed that people on social assistance, if they come off and they're in a precarious job, they really don't have a lot of incentive to stay working that hard and not being able to have benefits and things like that. And, um, and we also discussed having some ties to education and to training for those who are on social assistance so that they can have a view to coming off and not returning. That's it. Good evening, everyone. It's about discrimination. 
how does discrimination manifest itself in Canada in everything, in employment, in um, policing, in housing, in everything. The second question, what are the existing mechanisms to address discrimination? We have Criminal Code of Canada, Human Rights Commission, we have workplace harassment policies, code of professionalism of many organizations, education system. And um, the last question is, what changes would you advocate and to whom order to improve the situation? Um, the mechanism would be human rights courses in primary schools to promote the dialogue about human rights, ongoing modifications to law, mobilizing communi communities, education, raising the awareness by conferences of this nature, and um, starting the dialogue inside the family. Thank you. Uh, we have a request to have the names of all the speakers so that we can find you if we need to clarify the notes. Yes. Thank you very, very much for your patience and very, very active discussion and contribution to the topics. Thank you. Good night.